So let's get back into the Word. Last Sunday I told you about the fatally flawed temple model that existed before Christ Jesus came. Uh, the temple model basically, they're going to put that up for us. The temple model basically talks about this. and Just leave that up, if you will, uh, Priscilla, until I tell you to change it. But there's always a sacred place. We're talking about what actually happened before Christ came and died on the cross. But in the old temple model, there was always a sacred place. And it was revered as a holy parcel of land on which the house of the Lord was placed. Uh, there's always a sacred text. It might have been an inscription or an oracle of some kind. And in the temple model, you always have sacred men. And this is where it kind of really got way off and out of kilter. Uh, the sacred men have possession of the sacred text. And, and they tell sincere yet oftentimes misguided followers, here's how you're supposed to live your life. And if you don't behave, God's going to get you. And they manipulate people with fear uh, of eternal damnation. If you don't do what I say and how I'm teaching you, you have to kind of adhere to that. So when Jesus came, he destroyed the temple model. He, he wasn't a newer or updated version of a broken system, which was fatally broken. He, in fact, started something brand new, a dynamic movement focused on the simple command to love God, love people, and to love your enemies. Love God, love people, and to love your enemies. And, and this new dynamic movement exploded out of the gate on opening day and as I told you last week, thousands of Jewish people in and around the area of Judea became a part. They, they came in and, and joined the fellowship of believers. But, but there was a problem in the early church that kept rearing its ugly head. And, and the simple truth is, old habits die hard. Old habits die hard. The Jews, who were so used to the temple model, kept trying to hold on to some of the elements of the flawed temple system and they kept trying to integrate that old system, the temple model, into the new dynamic movement that Jesus started. And Jesus' intentions was that the temple model be completely done away with, erased, annihilated, destroyed. We're not doing that anymore. But they kept trying to hold on to it and integrate the two, this new movement that Jesus started with the old temple model and how that they were brought up to believe. In fact, for them... Uh, they, they were struggling to, to let it go, but for them it actually felt kind of sacrilegious to abandon the old temple law. It felt disrespectful. This is something that had been with them for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and it felt disrespectful to them to just kind of forget about it and embrace something brand new. And that brings us to a very, very important point, and this is true for everybody in this room pretty much. I think most everybody would fall under this. Our consciences determine religious realities whether they reflect reality or not. Our consciences determine religious realities whether they reflect reality or not. I want to explain that to you, and I'm going to try to simplify it as best I can. Now, we've all experienced this, and we all struggle with this. Have you ever looked at someone and said, Hey, you shouldn't feel that way. Now, guys... Don't say that to your wives. That, that brings death and destruction, annihilation. Just don't do that. Or how about this one? Um, you shouldn't feel guilty about that. Listen, when someone says, hey, you shouldn't feel guilty about that, just because they said it, does that make your guilt go away? It's nice to hear it, but you, it generally doesn't deal with the problem of your guilt. You still feel guilty. Why? Because your conscience has been, follow me now, your conscience has been fine-tuned to a certain set of va values. H have you ever been hanging out with friends and, and you know, you're just chilling and, and whether you're, you know, at a bar or wherever that you're at, and, you know, whatever you're doing, but they cross a moral line and you're not comfortable following them across that line? Or it might be you. You, you cross a moral line and they're not comfortable following you across that moral line. Um, or, or maybe, you know, it, anyway, it happens all the time. That's because our consciences are fine-tuned to a certain set of values that were instilled in us throughout our lives. And if you grew up in a church environment, your conscience was fine-tuned to the core values of that religious environment in which you grew up in. Whether those values were biblically correct or not, whether they, they reflect reality or not, if that's what you grew up with, that's how your conscience identifies with rea religious reality. Now, 
And here's the thing, you're also prone to defend what you were taught even if you can't defend it with sound biblical theology. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to pick on me because if I picked on you, this would really tick you off. I grew up as a Pentecostal boy. My dad was a Pentecostal pastor. And back in those days, we had many, many rules. I was talking to a friend this week about this, and we kind of engaged in this in the parking lot and kind of reflected on some of this stuff, and it, it caused me to put this in the sermon. But we had many rules to live by, and some were much more difficult to adhere to than others. Let me give you some of the terminology that I grew up with as a boy in a very, very strict Pentecostal organization. One, one of the kind of things that was very common, a little saying that no worldly entertainment. That meant we couldn't go to the movies, we couldn't go to professional wrestling matches, and I was a Dusty Rhodes, Ox Baker fanatic. Um, we couldn't go to stock car races, we couldn't go to pro football or basketball games. One of the rules was that guys and girls couldn't swim together. And I asked my dad, I'll never forget the time I went to my dad in ninth or 10th grade in high school, and I said, Dad, can I go to the beach with some friends? They're, we're having a, a skip day, and we all wanted to go to the beach. And he's like, son, you can't go swimming with girls who are wearing bikinis. And I was like, why not? <laughs> why? Because you're Pentecostal. And I'm like, I don't want to be Pentecostal anymore. I want to be Presbyterian. All my Presbyterian friends are going to the beach. You know? <laughs> Thing is, Presbyterian consciences versus Pentecostal consciences, we were raised in a different kind of mindset. So their consciences were conditioned one way, and mine was being conditioned another. Now, let me, let me take this a step further, just to bring this up into modern day times. At Crosspoint, we have a lot of people here who were raised Catholic, okay? Catholic consciences are, are certainly conditioned totally different than a Pentecostal conscience like what mine was conditioned growing up. Uh, one area where our consciences were conditioned differently pertains to alcohol. Uh, my conscience was conditioned for no alcohol and no bikinis. No alcohol, no bikinis. No alcohol, no bikinis. Total abstinence on the alcohol, total abstinence on the bikinis. No exceptions. So I had a lot of Catholic friends growing up, played football and ran track in high school, and, and they, um, they found it hard to believe that I wasn't allowed to go to the beach and that alcohol was off limits. They were like, dude, we, we drink alcohol at church. And I'm like, what kind of church do you go to? And I'm, we're, we're Catholic, you know, I'm Catholic, but, but why don't you drink? Why, you know, why don't you drink? And, and I didn't know why. I mean, I, I couldn't defend that. I just, I was like, because you're not supposed to. I, is that it? They'd say, is that, is that all you got? And I'm like, pretty much. And, and they'd be, well, Jesus turned water into wine. And I'm going, yeah, but that wasn't real wine. That's what I was taught, you know. That's, that's the way my daddy put me off. That wasn't real wine, boy. And, I, and then I'd kind of kick back with something like this, and we're all underage, and really it's kind of against the law, so you're not supposed to do it anyway. <laughs> my point is this. The way you're raised and the way religion is presented to you will fine-tune your conscience. You following me on that? That's why next week's sermon will make a lot of people really, really mad. And you don't want to miss it because I promise you there will be fireworks going off in this room next week. Back to my point. The early Jewish Christians attempted to interject the old temple model in the new dynamic movement that Jesus started. They were trying to, to blend the old with the new. They wouldn't let go of how they were raised. For hundreds and hundreds of years, their consciences had been fine-tuned by a certain set of values and, and laws, 630 laws to be exact, that they had lived their lives by, and they struggled to let go of that, and they were trying to blend that life that they had been taught for so many years with this new, brand-new thing that Jesus had brought. So they tried to hang on to a lot of their Old Testament thinking and blend Jesus' teaching into temple teaching. And then along came the Apostle Paul to the church's rescue. He's going to fix this whole thing. And Paul doesn't show up in history as a Christian. Most of you know his story, but he shows up as a Pharisee 
who had set out to single-handedly destroy the church, and he would have done it too, except for the fact that God hijacked his heart on the Damascus Highway that day. It was a huge conversion the day that saw the, the Pharisee join the Jesus movement and became Paul the Apostle. Now watch this. This is really cool. He was a brilliant guy, and he was well-versed and very educated, very intelligent man, and he knew that Jesus had started something very new. He knew what had happened. He had talked to eyewitnesses of the resurrection. He had seen uh, everything that had transpired, how the church exploded out of the gate on opening day. And he knew that this was something totally different. He understood the dynamics of it. Not an updated version of the temple model. And Paul understood better than anybody how dangerous it would be to try to import the temple model into this new dynamic movement that Jesus started. So Paul goes over, you know, he goes all over the area, this area of the world and in these regions, and he's planning these little ecclesias, these little dynamic movements, what we call churches, but as they call ecclesias, uh, uh, you know, a gathering of peoples around a, a single event in history that changed the world, the resurrection of Christ. It was a dynamic movement, and he's out there planting little ecclesias all over uh, the region and outside of the cities of Jerusalem. And, and what he would do, he would, he would teach them. As he started a new work, he would teach them about the gospel of Christ and how it started and what Christ intended. He would start them off on the right path, and he would move on to the next place, and he'd plan another little dynamic movement, and then another, and then another. And as was often the case, whenever he would leave one area, and a, a group of Jewish Christians would come in behind him to kind of help Paul out a little bit, and they basically would mess up everything that he taught the people about the brand new thing Jesus started, because they came in with the notion to blend the old with the new, okay? Okay? So this was a problem. They were like, hey, Paul didn't tell you everything. We, we need to help you out and get you caught up here. There's more to it than that. Thing is, to be a part of this new movement, you've got to become Jewish. You've got to be a Jew. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah and all that, you know. And so you've got to, you, you've got to convert if you want to be a part of this new movement. And their actions... What they were doing coming in behind Paul, it evoked extreme frustration and anger from the Apostle Paul. He was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's not right. Jesus didn't come here to add to or update the old temple model that was so ineffective. He did away with it and he started something brand new. What do you guys not see or get about that? So Paul writes a letter to the Jewish Christians who believe that Gentiles must convert to Judaism to join this Jesus movement. And again, these were Jesus' followers, but they believed Jesus was an updated version of the old temple model. They're trying to integrate the two. So if you're going to be a Jesus follower, you've got to become Jewish first. Now, that sounds simple enough, except for the fact, and this was a big deal, it was actually quite complicated for Gentiles to do, especially the men, because it required a, a little bit of very painful surgery. So the Gentiles were like, you know, I want to be a part of the Jesus movement, but the whole notion of that surgery, not really into that. But the Jewish Christians would, would contend, come on, you need to go all in. He died for you. Can't you have a little surgery for him? You know, that was their selling point. They wanted to blend the old with the new because they didn't want to give up the temple model that they had lived with for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? Right? So Paul hears how they're contaminating these new churches that he had started up, and he's enraged by it. He's really frustrated. And he goes on a rant, and a bunch of people try to tell him, hey, man, you're, you're kind of overdoing this. Calm down a little bit. There's no reason to make such a big deal out of this. It doesn't really matter. And Paul emphatically came on to say this. He said, don't you get it? It's all that matters. It's all that matters. Jesus, Jesus started something brand new, and you're contaminating something brand new with the temple model. So let's spend a few moments, and let's look at how Paul answers those who, who thought it was no big deal because he wanted to really make a point here. And he jumps right in to straighten this out. And he says this from Galatians 5 and 1. He said, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Let me tell you something that I'll explain in the next couple of weeks. If after you become a Christian, I'm going to be very emphatic about this because I want you to get it, and I want to, I want to, I want to convey this to some level of the same intensity that Paul must have, and I hope that you feel that. 
But if after you become a Christian, you begin to feel constricted by religious rules, do's and don'ts, and you begin to feel like instead of finding freedom in Christ, you've had your life tied up in religious chains, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. If your version and your experience of following Jesus isn't described as freedom, there's something wrong with your version of Christianity. That pushes against boys that was raised like I was. We don't like to hear that. He goes on, he said, If for freedom, it's, it is for freedom that Christ set us free, stand firm. Stand firm then and don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, as if they didn't know who was writing this, he's just, he's being emphatic. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. He says, if you have that surgery that they're saying you must have, then you don't understand who Jesus is and what Jesus is all about. Now, there's no way around this, okay? I have to explain circumcision. Paul was not against the process or the procedure of circumcision. In fact, Paul was Jewish. He was circumcised. All of Jesus' original followers were circumcised. Many of you have been circumcised. In fact, if you have... No, don't raise your hand. That's just a a joke. Relax. It's just a joke. Lighten the mood. Because I can. I can. I don't know, I, there's no reason, I, you know, I just can. I can poke and prod and it's just what I do. Circumcision wasn't the problem. Paul was not against the procedure of circumcision. But Paul says, look, if you allow yourself to be circumcised, you're embracing the old covenant instituted under the temple model. Jesus did away with that when he brought and initiated a brand new covenant. The old covenant was wiped away. Now, this isn't the old covenant. There's a a different covenant. It's something brand new. And if you lean back into the old covenant in any way, you nullify everything Christ has done for you. He said, Christ will be of no value to you at all. You've abandoned the new to embrace the old. He goes on. He says, again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. If you're going to go back and take a little piece of the old covenant, Covenant, the old law, the temple model, he said, you, gotta, you can't have this too. you got to take the whole old law or you got to stick and cling to the new covenant that Christ has established. You've got to pick one. Pick one or the other. You, you just can't keep reaching back and holding on and then reaching forward to grab a hold of the new. He said, again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to the whole law. Pick one or the other, but you can't have both. You can't blend them, blend them together or you defile everything Christ did for you. He says this, you who are trying to be justified, in other words, made right with God, you're trying to get peace with God. By the law, he's referring to the old temple model, the old covenant, the Old Testament law. By the law, you have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. They're like, no, we haven't. Why, why, are you, why are you saying this? We haven't. We're just trying to honor our own conscience. How we were raised, the things that we were taught, how our conscience was conditioned all throughout our lives. We're just trying to do what we were taught and still be a part of this incredible dynamic movement. We're not willing to let that go because, you know, that's kind of who we are. That's how we were raised. I want to do something here this morning. I'm going to come out front a little bit. I have a crystal clear bottle of water, and in this vial I have some contaminated blood, okay? This is, uh, for the sake of clarification let's just say inside this vial is blood that is disease ridden that there's trace elements of um, cancer of AIDS uh, of any other kind of a vile disease that is you know that is so damning to humanity that it's in this vial now there's 16 ounces of crystal clear water okay I'm going to put One drop. 
I'm sorry, that was two. Came out fast. And if I told you that one drop of that contaminated blood in that 16 ounces. Now, there's, the ratios are to, my, to your favor, right? I mean, what are the chances? But if I told you that that one or two drops in that 16 fluid ounces had the potential of destroying your life and killing you, but you know there's 16 fluid ounces of crystal clear water that this started with, and I'd like for you to have this as my gift to you. And I'm not going to promise or, you know, I'm not going to guarantee you anything. I'm just going to say that I think you'll be okay. I can't promise that because I don't really know, but it's okay. It's not much. It's just a trace amount. And I, anybody in the room with good common sense, would you want to drink it? I don't think I would. I don't think there's any amount of money that you could give me or there's nothing that you could prop up that would cause me to want to drink that bottle of water after it's been contaminated with a disease, contaminated blood that could absolutely have an effect on who you are and potentially wipe or annihilate your life out. Paul says this. He said the moment you try to mix the old with the new, even a trace amount of it, even just a little bit of it, you nullify grace and you are alienated from Christ. Christ died to pay for your sins. You didn't deserve what he did for you, but he did it anyway. That's called grace. Amen? The moment you reach back for the old and you just take a drop of that, you contaminate the new, and Christ will be of no value to you at all because you're telling Jesus by reaching back what you did on the cross was not good enough for me. I don't trust that that sacrifice to give me eternal life is going to pan out, so I'm going to try to keep paying for my debt, my sin problem, myself. I'm going to keep reaching back under the old. I can't fully embrace the new. I'm going to keep reaching, out, reaching back trying to make this work. Somebody would say, Pastor, that's, that's too extreme. Paul hasn't even got to the extreme part yet. The extreme part's still to come. Watch what he says. He said, for in Christ, this new dynamic Jesus, Jesus movement, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. He says, I'm a Jew. I was circumcised, but that's not why God loves me. He said, you're a Gentile, and you weren't circumcised. Doesn't matter. Christ did away with all that. This is something brand new. We're no longer under that old law. I believe the main thing that makes the church so resistible today Hear me now. The thing that makes the church so resistible today is what Paul talks about next because we can't seem to get this right. We just can't seem to get it right. Are you ready for this? This is what he said. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Wait a minute, Paul. What about the Ten Commandments? Don't they count? How about those 630 laws under the old covenant, under the old temple model? Uh, you, don't, don't they count? Let's try this again, Paul. Maybe you need to back up and think about what you're saying. How many things matter? You want to go again? How many things matter? Paul says, one thing matters. One thing, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Amen. Amen. Let me explain that, because everybody wasn't on board. Paul said it. Don't get ticked off at me. Get ticked off at Paul, and he don't care. You see, the temple model is completely and utterly focused on me and you earning God's favor, doing stuff to gain the favor of God. And it's, it kind of goes like this every day. God, how am I doing? God, how am I doing? Am I doing okay? How am I doing, God? Did you see what I did over there? How am I doing? Am I doing all right? I'm just trying to do right, Lord. I just want to please you. Just trying to do right by you. It's all vertical. It's like, it's, it's like this. Me looking up, never looking around, but always looking up. God, how am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? And Paul says, that day is over. You need to understand that. That day is, is over. If you're a Christian, if you believe that Jesus is your Messiah or the Son of God or died for your sins, Paul says, look. You don't have to worry about what God thinks about you anymore. 
Quit worrying about that. If you believe that God sent Jesus into the world and died for your sins and you've embraced that, you're okay with God. You're in. Listen, if someone will die for you, they are for you. Amen? You never have to to go to bed wondering how you and God are doing. You're fine. You're okay. So shut up already. Amen. God says if you place your trust in Jesus, Jesus has settled the issue for you. Amen? It's not based on your merit. We're not under the old law or the temple model anymore. You can't earn God's favor. You just can't do it. The one thing God wants from you is for you to treat other people. Quit worrying about this vertical relationship and start worrying about your horizontal relationships because that's how God's judging the whole world now. How you treat other people. That's the only thing that counts. God is fine. Don't worry about Him. Focus on the horizontal, not the vertical. When you lay down at night to close your eyes, you don't have to wonder anymore and say, God, I hope we're good. Paul says that's temple thinking. And it doesn't matter. That day has come and gone. Put a bow on it. It's history. He continues, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you? Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? And then, and then, and this is really good, he says something some of you can really appreciate. He said, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Yeast is a single-cell fungus. Think about that. Yeast, a single-cell fungus. So take just a pinch and, and put it in this thick, gooey dough and give it a little time, and the whole thing, the whole dynamic of that dough will change. In other words, a little bit of temple model a little bit of legalism, a little bit of, okay, God, how am I doing, how am I doing, how am I doing? Paul says just a pinch of that pollutes the whole thing. It's like putting one drop of diseased blood in a crystal clear bottle of water. Paul's emotional about it. He's adamant. He's, he's, he's upset. He's, he's, he's really into this thing. And somebody says, Paul, you need to just settle down. It's not a big deal. Let them hold on to a little piece of the old temple model. It's not hurting anything. And Paul says, actually, it is. It nullifies the grace of God, alienates people from Christ, and makes his work on the cross of no value to you at all. It's a really big deal. Paul's angry and emotional, and he's about to really show them how angry he is. Told you he was going to get extreme. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. I'm going to interpret that for you. He says, don't stop with circumcision. Why not cut the whole thing off? That bothers me. Does it bother anybody else? That makes me want to lean a little bit more into grace. I'm telling you. You should read the Bible. It's in there. Paul is saying, you don't understand what's at stake here. Even a little bit of the temple model, just one drop of it, will destroy this dynamic movement and make it resistible. Don't try to blend the old with the new. It corrupts everything. Here's what Paul knew about the temple model, and this is what he conveyed, and we'll talk more about this next week. The temple model, in that model, leaders would become self-righteous. They got empowered. It it corrupted the church when when the government, and I talked about this a few weeks ago, when the government got involved in the church and Constantine started interfering and meddling with doctrinal issues in the church, and the church gained all kinds of political power, and you go back and read in history how corrupt the church got and how bad things got. It was an ugly, ugly period where the Spirit of Christ just pushed away from the church completely, and it went into apostasy, a a period known by Bible scholars as the Dark Ages. Leaders would become self-righteous and corrupt to the core. Followers would become hypocrites. Texts would be manipulated, and people in that kind of system would be mistreated. They would just be mistreated. Have you ever been mistreated by a church? That usually happens when you break their rules. Paul said, wait a minute, Christians. You're forgetting the only thing that matters. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Paul knew if we cling to old things that we're going to miss the main thing. 
So he continues and, and clarifies yet again the main thing. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. That's the, there's that free word again, okay? But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh rather than serve one another, rather serve one another humbly and in love. He says, look, look, this isn't about unrestrained indulgence. This isn't about going out and just doing whatever you want. What, if it feels good, do it kind of thing. Or doing whatever that you want just because you can. And that you can go out and live any way that you want. He said, that's not showing love to everybody around you either. Because your actions have consequences. And usually, your actions don't just affect you. They affect the people all around you that you say you love. Paul says, whoa, if you think the main thing is going to make everything so, so you can do whatever you want to do... You don't understand what the main thing is. Let me try one more time. Pentecostals, you know, I was raised a Pentecostal boy, and I'm a non-denominational boy now, but we, we grew up praying every night because we were scared that something was going to happen. You know, if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. So, Lord, if there's anything standing between me and you, I want to be forgiven of it. And I'd list all this stuff that I knew I'd done that day. And then just a blanket coverage policy, just a real insurance policy. And I'd say, and if I've forgotten anything that I've done wrong, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me in Jesus' name. So if I should die before I wake, you know how it goes. <laughs> because they had literally scared the hell out of me at church. And I'd close my eyes and say, we're good now, right, God? We're good, we're okay. Baptists would, you know, have a different spin, same concept, different spin. Well, I've confessed Christ, so I'm covered, and I can do whatever I want with no more repercussions. Catholics say, well, I go to Mass and confess my sin to the priest, and God forgives me, wash, rinse, repeat, dump that bucket out, go fill it back up again. The truth is... Same process, different denominational backgrounds, different convictions of our consciences, but the same thing, whether you want to admit that or not. It's kind of the same thing. It's an old temple model. You can redefine it any way you want to, but it's a temple model, and God has a problem with that. It's just not working. And, and, and Jesus was sent to annihilate that old temple model. My brothers and sisters, you were called to be free, but you don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love for the entire law. The Old Testament temple model is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment. Gentiles, you're not going to have to memorize all 630 laws that the Jews have memorized. You're not even going to have to remember the Ten Commandments. The entire law, he said, is fulfilled with this one commandment, Love your neighbor as yourself. This is so powerful because this is in the book of Leviticus. This was in the Jewish law. This was in the Old Testament. It's as if Paul was saying, hey, the Jews had it right. The Jews had it right. They had this kernel of truth that would one day be exploited to expand to all generations everywhere. Follow me now. I'm fixing to finish. Big finish. Paul says the way you love God vertically now is by loving your neighbors horizontally. The temple model asks God, how are we doing? How are we doing? Are we okay? Is everything all right? Or do I have peace with God? The Jesus model says how you're doing depends on how you treat other people. All people, that's because all people, all people matter to God. God, are we okay? God says, hey, we're fine. We're fine. Quit worrying about that. You've placed your faith and trust in Jesus who did what you were not capable of doing. He, he paid the penalty for your sin. You're covered. You're fine. Quit worrying about your horizontal relationship with me. I'm going to judge you by how you treat the people around you. I'm watching to see how you love your neighbors. That's now the measurement of favor with God. Quit worrying about me. Start worrying about your relationship with others. Focus on getting things right with the people around you because when things are right with the people around you, things are always going to be right with me. When you get this right, your religious experience as a Christian will be characterized more by freedom than anything else. When you get this right, you'll treat people better. They'll no longer walk away from the church with a bad church story or a bad church experience. And the church will be the dynamic movement Jesus set in motion 2,000 years ago. A church where unconditional love expresses itself for all of us. I 
I made myself a little note, and I, I'm trying to decide if I want to share this with you, and I'm truly, I'm going to change your opinion of me because some of you can't let go of the past. When I first, the very first church I ever pastored, I was a rule keeper. The denomination had passed down a strict set of rules. I went into the first church with the mindset that I got to keep the rules and I got to be a good pastor, basically, because I don't want to be at this little bitty tiny church all the, you know, forever. We'll grow it up to 100 people or so. You go there with about 10 or 12 and you build a church to 100, you get a promotion in the denomination. You get to go to a bigger church and try again, and it just keeps going and keeps going. And so I wanted to be a good, loyal, denominational boy. So I memorized the rules, the things that they said were paramount and important. And sure enough, it didn't take long for me to have to have to um, enforce some of those strict rules. There was a young guy. I'm friends with them still to this day. I've made my peace with them. It still haunts me, okay? It bothers me. There's a young couple, Randy and Bunny. They, um, they had come to a church got saved, was doing wonderful. He was I put him in as a youth director and a little group of five or six kids, you know, and wasn't a lot there when we first started, but he was so excited about Jesus, and they hung out at our house all the time. And one day in a conversation, Holly, I'm so ashamed to tell you this because that's not, don't judge me by my past. I do not live there anymore. But one day in a conversation over dinner, just sitting on the couch talking, he says something, you know, his wife is expecting their first child and they're fixing to have this baby and he goes well pastor you know we weren't married when she got pregnant and my heart just sunk I'm like oh my god this is my first test as a good denominational boy how am I going to handle this I said what do you mean he said well you know everybody in the community knows that we got pregnant before we got married and I, I married her after and you know just I just felt like I needed to tell you that I'm like oh man okay okay so I, I kind of walked away from the conversation. I come back to it, you know, and I'm, I'm, I've got this thing where I love this family and I'm so close to them, but I'm being held to a strict rule. And I, I called them back into my office. I said, look, I said, I have a problem. This, this organization has some rules and you've broken those rules. And I've talked to some people that's smarter than me, idiots that I thought were smarter than me. And... Uh, the only way to make this right is you need to stand up in front of the church and apologize for what you did. Whew, man. He, was, he had such a, a sincere heart. He said, Pastor, I trust you, and I love you. I think you love me too. He said, if you think that's what's best, that's what we'll do. And I made that couple stand up in front of a little group of about 50 people and apologize to a group of people that it, it was none of their business. None of their business. And it didn't take me long to start pushing back against that kind of stuff. In that same little church, there was a, a couple, our little church started growing and it was taking on growth. There, look, I'm so ashamed and I really probably am changing some p opinions of me, but I'm telling you, that's not who I am. And you know, if you know me, you know this is not who I am. And that's a reason, that, that's one of the main reasons that I'm not a part of the organization anymore because there were more things down the line that we just couldn't come to terms and grips with and we pushed away from all that. And there were many factors, but this is one of the main ones. Some of the things that, that the rules, the list of do's and don'ts. There was another couple that uh, sat in our living room and they were talking to us about church membership and wanted to join our church. And I'm like, well, here's, you know, let me go over our teachings with you. Here's the things we teach. And we get down to a subject called divorce and remarriage. And he goes, well, Pastor, we've both been married before. And, man, another test for the good old denominational boy. I said, man, I'm sorry. I, the, the church has rules, and I, I can't take you in as members. If you've been married before, you can't be a part of this church. I'll never forget what that meant. His, his countenance changed. He was crushed. He looked at me. His last name was Keg. I've never been able to find this family. Uh, but he looked at me. He said, so you're telling me that my son, and he pointed to his little boy, he said, you telling me my son is a bastard? Whew, man, that cut me to the bone. I said, no, sir, no, sir, I'm not telling you that. He said, yeah, that's actually what you, you're telling me. I can't be a part of a church that believes that. 
And they left our little church and never came back and went down and joined another church right down the road that was loving people unconditionally and got involved in, in growing exponentially, doing some great things for God. Look, let me explain something to you because a lot of you have a similar story where some goofball preacher did you the same way for maybe different circumstances or whatever. Can you imagine, can you imagine how different our communities would be how different our nation would be if the Christians just decided there's really only one thing that matters, my faith in Christ manifesting itself in love for other people. Can you imagine how it would change perception of, of Christians in our culture today? The thing for me was, and the reason I'm here and not there, is it didn't feel like freedom to me anymore. It didn't feel like freedom to me anymore. It felt like slavery. If after you accept Jesus, you don't feel free, you're doing it wrong. And I decided they were doing it wrong. And when I started pushing back and trying to help change it, I got pushed out virtually. There are some details in there where I was real ugly. I got ugly. I've made a lot of apologies since we walked away. I've sat down with people one-on-one -on -one that I, I've roughed up and said some things to, and I've begged their forgiveness. Same thing I did with Randy and Bunny and... If I could have ever found the Keg family, I would, have, I would have done the same thing with them. But Paul said there's really only one thing that matters. You're letting all this other stuff happen. He said you've got to allow your faith to manifest itself in love for other people. That's it. That's the most important thing. That creates a dynamic movement. That is the dynamic movement. Here's what I know for certain. If you're here today or you're watching online and you had a bad church experience and that bad experience has made church resistible for you and you just don't want anything to do with it, here's what I think I know. I bet it wasn't because the people at the church believed in Jesus. That's probably not why you pushed away. That, that wasn't your bad church experience, was it? You don't resist church because we're loyal to Jesus and we, we call him the king of our lives. That's not why you pushed away from the church or resisted. That's not why you push. The reason you pushed away and the reason that you say you had a bad church experience wasn't because of our loyalty to Christ. It was because of how the church treated you. It's hard to hear, isn't it? Cross pointers, what does love require of us? If you filter the next week every day through that question, I wonder how things would change around your life. It'll change your life and everybody's life you come in contact with. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So instead of some of that junk that you're going to post on social media all the time, how about if we, we share some stuff that shows our faith expressing itself in love? You have my blessing to do that, and we'll not consider it pride or boasting this coming week. You know, somebody, some smart aleck's going to call you out on it. Don't, don't retaliate. But, but do that. Let, let your faith express itself in love and help our brothers and sisters see what love actually looks like. Reach out to somebody that you normally wouldn't reach out to. Embrace a demographic of people that you normally wouldn't embrace. Do something different. We're going to talk about the specifics of how to become a dynamic church that expresses faith through love. We're going to, we're going to get to that next week, and some of you is not going to like it. Matter of fact, we may not have 1,500 people here on Easter Sunday. We, we may clear this thing out. and you, we've, we've been small before, and we, we can start over again if that's what... God requires of us. Please don't do that, Jesus. <laughs> How do we become the irresistible church where our faith expresses itself in love? I'll tell you next week. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, we are eternally lost without the love of Christ. We are diluted Every time we reach back and embrace a temple model, the old law, the old covenant, our strict set of rules and rigid beliefs, how we were raised, I can't just let go of that. I, you know, I want to be a part of a church like Cross Point, but boy, I can't hardly let go. I just I struggle with it, Pastor. Father, help us to get this burned into our spirit to express our faith through our love to other people. That's how you're judging this whole world, how we treat others. 
If we've made peace with you through Jesus Christ and the atoning blood of Christ, the perfect sinless blood of Jesus, if we've made peace by embracing Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're good with you. Now you're holding us to a standard of being right with others, our neighbors, our enemies. We love God by loving Jesus. We, we love our neighbors and we love our enemies. That's the standard by which the world is being judged and we don't even get it. We keep thinking it's a list of do's and don'ts and we're messing this up royally. Help us to get it right. Help us to lean into faith. Lay down our swords and pick up our serving towels. And wash some feet. Wash somebody's feet and be humble servants of the Most High God. Just like Jesus knelt down and washed the disciples' feet. He, he, he shifted the entire order. He said, you used to look for somebody else to come in and you'd hire a servant to wash your feet. But he said, I'm telling you, the least among you shall become the greatest and the greatest shall become the least. We're going to shift the paradigm. We're going to shift the order. The old law is no longer relevant. Now, my people are going to serve one another. They're going to love one another unconditionally. They're going to love everybody. Lord, if we get this, it'll change how we respond to people, how we reply to social media posts. It, it will change every, every aspect of our lives if we realize that God is watching and the measure of our righteousness is no longer what we do for Him. How many times we come to church? How much time we pay? Keeping all the, the list of do's. And the measure of our righteousness today is how are we treating other people? That's what will make it a dynamic church again when we get this right. Help us to get it right in Jesus' name.